Hi, welcome to Lesson 6, Unit 10, A House Divided Cannot Stand. Today we're going to talk about the final events that ultimately led up to the United States Civil War. But before we begin, let's always, as always, let's kick things off with the hook question. The brother of what incredibly infamous person saved the life of Abraham Lincoln's son? You're not going to believe this, but this character right here, his brother actually ended up saving Abraham Lincoln's son's life. And hopefully you recognize this person's face. We talked about him in lessons past. This is John Wilkes Booth, the person who assassinated Abraham Lincoln at the end of the Civil War. During the Civil War, his brother was in New Jersey on a train platform, sharing that platform with Lincoln's son, Roger Todd Lincoln. Roger was taking a step back because he was trying to make room for people who were trying to get on a plane, on, on a, excuse me, train, and he accidentally fell off of the platform in the path of an approaching train. Edwin uh, Booth, John Wilkes Booth's brother, reached down and uh, grabbed Lincoln's son by the collar, pulled him onto the platform, and saved his life. Now, at the time, Edwin had no idea who he was pulling out of the uh, gutter there, whose, whose life he was saving. And it's, it stands to reason that he might not have had the same reaction had he known that it was Lincoln's son. Um, it's obvious that John Wilkes Booth was no fan of Abraham Lincoln, and uh, it stands to reason that his brother wasn't either. Anywho, John Wilkes Booth, uh, we know, was no fan of Lincoln or of the North. Uh, he was r really, really inspired to uh, work to leave the Union after a very traumatic event in the South. This guy invaded Harper's Ferry. Remember, John Wilkes Booth actually traveled hundreds of miles just to see John Brown hang. And that just goes to show how much he despised abolitionists, how much he despised the North, and how much he hated the fact that Northerners, in his view, uh, were conducting a grand conspiracy to take the rights of Southerners away. Uh, that being, of course, the right of Southerners to take away the rights of African Americans and hold them as slaves. So John Wilkes Booth and a number of other people uh, began vocally calling for the South to secede from the Union. These people delivered really, really fiery, really, really intense and uh, uh, passionate speeches, and they came to be known as fire eaters. So a fire eater is a pro-slavery, pro-secession Southerner. And these guys, looking at uh, John Brown and how he invaded the South, believed that compromise was over. They believed that there was no reason anymore to try to keep North and South together. The question for fire eaters wasn't whether or not the South should secede from the Union. The question was, when would the South secede from the Union? And these guys were looking far and wide for any excuse whatsoever to ultimately leave the country and start their own Southern slave empire, as they termed it, a Southern slave republic. And that excuse was coming really, really soon after John Brown's raid. Take a step back and talk about two very famous people at the time, two politicians out of Illinois. We have Abraham Lincoln and we have Stephen Douglas. Both were running for the Senate in 1858, I believe. Yes, 1858. And during this time, Abraham Lincoln and Lincoln Douglas traveled throughout Illinois to about seven cities, and they debated in front of huge crowds of people and these people listened very closely to what these two politicians had to say in order to figure out really where they stood on the most important and pressing issue of the time, slavery. To that question, Abraham Lincoln had this to say, I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. This is an excerpt from Lincoln's House Divided speech. And in this excerpt, he's saying, look, America cannot be half slave, half free. America either has to be all slave or all free. And considering the fact that he was a Republican, Southerners immediately took this to mean that Abraham Lincoln's long-term goal was to outlaw slavery throughout the land. Consequently, Southerners looked to Abraham Lincoln as their number one enemy. And uh, they were terrified of the possibility of him being elected president. However, keep in mind, Lincoln... Uh, uh, Stephen Douglas was the largest Democratic politician at this time. 
the Dem Democratic Party was old and established at this point. And Stephen Douglas was probably the most powerful person in Washington um, during this period of history. This is what Stephen Douglas had to say to the nation during the Lincoln-Douglas debates. This quote is called the Freeport Doctrine. In my opinion, the people of a territory can, by lawful means, exclude slavery from their limits. It matters not what way the Supreme Court may decide. The people have the lawful means to introduce or to exclude it as they please. Okay, this is huge because in this quote, Stephen Douglas, the Democrat, is um, taking aim at a Supreme Court decision. Maybe you remember the worst Supreme Court decision in American history the Dred Scott decision. The Dred Scott decision made popular sovereignty, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the Missouri Compromise, really any attempt by the federal government to limit slavery in the territories illegal. Um, Justice Roger Taney called it unconstitutional. So the South had already won the ultimate legal victory. According to them, states could no longer prohibit, no government really in the country could prohibit slavery um, in the territories and maybe even in the states. In this quote, Stephen Douglas says no to the Southerners. Stephen Douglas reasserts the legitimacy or the, uh, the correctness of the doctrine called popular sovereignty, where people through majority vote can limit slavery in their territory by lawful means. So the Southerners are looking at Abraham Lincoln and thinking he is the worst thing ever to run for president. And they're not too happy with Stephen Douglas either, because Stephen Douglas is telling them to give up on the Dred Scott decision. In other words, the Southerners really don't have a good option up until the election of 1860. This is the election of 1860. There were four candidates, and I'm really just going to focus on three of the four. I'm sure you recognize Abraham Lincoln, the Republican candidate. Or uh, tearing up the map of the country, uh, right next to him is Stephen Douglas. And you'll notice Stephen Douglas in this slideshow is a northern Democrat. But wait a second, I thought there was just one Democratic Party. Well, remember how I said that a lot of Southerners did not like Stephen Douglas because of the Freeport Doctrine, the quote that he made during the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and for other reasons. Because of this, Southerners left the Democratic Party. They established a Southern Democratic Party, and they got their own candidate, Jay Breckinridge, to run for president as well. And finally, a guy named John Bell ran for the Union Party, and he represented states in between the North and the South who were desperate to keep the country together. But the big parties out there were the Republicans and the Democrats. And you can imagine, if there's only one Republican Party and there are two Democratic parties, uh, who's going to win the election of 1860? Think about it this way. If you're a Republican voter, you have one candidate to vote for. If you are of a Democratic persuasion, now you have two. To put it simply, as soon as the Democratic Party split in two, Republicans were overjoyed because this basically meant that even though they were a very, very young party, they were very likely, if not almost um, uh, definitely, going to win the election of 1860. And the, the really funny thing is a lot of these Southern Democrats who split the party in two wanted Abraham Lincoln to be elected. Remember those groups, the group of people I, I talked about who wanted to secede more than anything else and they were just looking for an excuse? That's right. Southern fire eaters actively worked to break the Democratic Party in two. And they did this in order to make sure that Abraham Lincoln would get elected because to them, Abraham Lincoln getting elected meant that the South would eventually, what well, would, would secede, they would be done. That would be the straw that broke the camel's back. And it turns out that that's really kind of what happened. Let's take a look at the results of the election of 1861. At this map, you'll see that Lincoln won every single northern state, and uh, the uh, the other states were split between Douglas, Breckinridge, and Bell. Abraham Lincoln won forty percent of the popular vote in the election of eighteen sixty, so he didn't get over half of the popular vote. But remember, does the popular vote actually elect the president? Who actually elects the president? If you're thinking the Electoral College, that is correct. And because more people lived in the northern states than in the south, Abraham Lincoln won handily the Electoral College vote. 
again, as I mentioned, all free states voted for Abraham Lincoln. Really interesting is his name wasn't even on the ballot in nine southern states. So the fire eaters got their way. When Abraham Lincoln was elected president, um, uh, the, the state of South Carolina, who had been plot, the leaders of which had been plotting to leave the Union for some time now, decided to be the first out the, out the door. So South Carolina secedes from the Union, and this is what they wrote. Uh, we've come to learn that the guarantees of the Constitution will then no longer exist once Abraham Lincoln is elected. The equal rights of the states will be lost. The slaveholding states will no longer have the power of self-government, and the federal government will have become their enemy. These stirring words explain why South Carolina declared independence from the, uh, from the country, and they emphasize a, a, a conflict between the federal government and states' rights. And even today, a lot of people in the South claim that the reason the Civil War happened was because the South asserted their rights as states. However, most historians would say that the, the real reason the Civil War happened was because the southern states um, wanted to preserve the right of slavery, that is the right of taking away other people's rights. At the end of the day, slavery, most people would agree, was the ultimate cause of the Civil War. So, James Buchanan president at the time is in quite a pickle. Sure, Abraham Lincoln was elected president, but remember there's a certain period of time uh, uh, between when a new president is elected and when the quote unquote lame duck president is still in office before the new president is inaugurated. And so James Buchanan for a couple months continued to be president of the United States even after Abraham Lincoln was elected. And during that time, he did not do a whole lot to help things out. In his opinion, the states have no right to su succeed. That was his view. However, he also believed that he had no right as the, as the president of the United States to stop the states from doing this. In other words, he did not feel that he could use military force to prevent the states from leaving the Union. So, in the span of a few months after James Buchanan makes his views known, more states begin to see him. Single time a new southern state secedes, James Buchanan does nothing. By the time James Buchanan's presidency is over, seven states in the deep south have seceded from the Union. And not only have they seceded, they've joined up. They've joined up to form a new country, the Confederate States of the Union, and they even elect their first and only president. A guy by the name of Jefferson Davis, who we, we will be learning a lot about in the Civil War unit. The Union is dissolved under James Buchanan's watch, and the American people were none too happy about this, even at the time. This is a really great cartoon. It says, Our national bird, as it appeared, when handed to James Buchanan, March 4th, 1857. The identical bird as it appeared, A.D. 1861, the year that James Buchanan left office. Quite a difference. Take a look at the bird on the right. The bird is wearing a goofy shoe labeled Anarchy, and it's standing atop a, um, a, a peg leg that says Secession, and all of its plumage is gone. The proud and mighty bird of the United States is now a wreck as a result of James Buchanan's presidency, this cartoon suggests. So James Buchanan leaves the office in March of 1861, and this is the day, the formal day, when Abraham Lincoln stands before a crowd of thousands of people in Washington, D.C., and delivers his inaugural address, where he states firmly that the North and South should still be friends, and that the bonds that kept them together at the beginning should hold, and that, uh, and that uh, the South should return to the Union so that peace could be peace and prosperity could exist in the United States. Um, I love this picture because it's, it's very symbolic to me. Abraham Lincoln's delivering address to a, a nation that is in absolute crisis. And the very Capitol building behind him is under construction. Um, it's kind of symbolic to me of how the Civil War really did build a new nation um, after it was done. And you can actually see that taking place in this image. So 
when the South left the Union, all of those seven states had no desire to actually um, enter into a civil war with the North. They wanted to leave, be done with um, the United States of America, and start their own country. When each state left, military leaders and militia members in each state began seizing federal arsenals and forts and uh, uh, taking control of, of, of the weapons and organizing a military to resist any kind of interference by the North. But there was one fort that they did not seize in time. And that fort was out in the middle of the water, it was on an island, and it was called Fort Sumter. You can still visit, visit it to this day. <clears throat> Fort, speaking of symbols, Fort Sumter is located um, in probably the worst place you could you could imagine for a uh, Union fort. It's right outside of Charleston, South Carolina. So if you're looking at this map here, you can see that Fort Sumter is located in the heart of Confederate territory, the very right, right next to the very first state that left the Union. But it's being um, led by a guy named Major Robert Anderson. And Major Robert Anderson has absolutely no interest in surrendering to the South. He wants to maintain hold on this fort for the honor of the nation um, and uh, just because he's a patriot. The problem is Major Robert Anderson is beginning to run out of food. Abraham Lincoln knows this. So did James Buchanan before him. And Abraham Lincoln has a huge choice ahead of him. Does he send a flotilla of food down from the north to Fort Sumter to re-equip the fort with um, mostly food and men so that so that the fort can continue to be held by the north. The south makes clear that if this were to happen, they would fire on, on Fort Sumter. Abraham Lincoln is in a pickle because Major Anderson's men are starving. So ultimately, <clears throat> this is how the conversation basically went. President Lincoln, we're utterly famished. We must send them Taco Bell naked chicken chalupas. They're uh, scrumptious and only available for a limited time. This guy's name, by the way, is uh, William Seward. He's Abraham Lincoln's major advisor in the cabinet. Sir, that's madness. They're simply too delicious. You risk triggering an all-out war with the Confederacy. Jesus' beard, Seward. I will not be deterred. No Taco Bell naked chicken chalupas for you. You're cut off. Yes, speaking of history, these are the delicious Taco Bell naked chicken chalupas. Um, they're literally tacos where the shells are made out of chicken. They are scrumptious. So, uh, General Beauregard, the Confederate general who had surrounded Fort Sumter, saw this flotilla of food coming to Fort Sumter, and he had this to say. Chimney Crickets, the Yankees have sent Anderson delicious Taco Bell naked chicken chalupas. Why, they're only available for a limited time. Fire at will. All jokes aside, when Abraham Lincoln did send the flotilla down to Fort Sumter, it caused the South to fire on the fort. And for 34 hours, maybe it was 32 hours, I don't really remember, uh, cannonball after cannonball after cannonball plowed into the fort. When all the dust settled, this is what Fort Sumter looked like. The 87 men who were guarding the fort actually survived. Not a single person died, which is really amazing. But they were forced to surrender the fort to the victorious Confederates. This military action caused a huge surge of patriotism among other southern states. And shortly after the southern victory at Fort Sumter, four more states joined the Confederacy. So that brings the total number of states who seceded from the Union to 11. And so now we have two, two countries where one once existed. Uh, this final secession and Abraham Lincoln's... Um, uh, decisions to stop further states from going south was what ultimately led to civil war. And uh, our next unit will be talking about all the major events of the civil war. I hope you enjoyed this unit, A House Divided Cannot Stand, on the major events, the milestones that led to civil war. And I'm very excited to share with you the next unit on, on this conflict next week. Have a great day and thank you very much for listening.